Hello, and welcome to our new Adam Smith work series where we highlight papers related to the life, times, and ideas of Adam Smith. I'm Christy Horpital, assistant editor at Adam Smith Works, and today I'm talking with Brienne Wolf about her recently published journal article, Adam Smith's Cosmopolitan Liberalism, Taste, Political Economy, and Objectification. It's published by the University of Chicago Press for the Northeastern Political Science Association. Hello, Brienne. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I've got just a few questions for today to give our audience a bit about your paper and your larger research project. But first, I want you to think back to your very first encounter with Adam Smith or Adam Smith's ideas. And tell us, if you can, what you remember thinking about Smith the very first time you encountered him. Do you remember liking him or not liking him or being confused oh. by him or? Yeah, yeah. So in the class I was TAing for, I remember being very surprised because the selection of readings that we had included book five um, of Wealth of Nations and specifically the parts on education. And I remember thinking, wow, this, this thinker doesn't sound like the way he's been described to me in sort of popular, um, the popular imagination. And I definitely remember one of my students wrote an essay using Smith's ideas to justify um, national health care. And I remember thinking, this can't be right. Um, but he used textual evidence really well to sort of talk about how Smith cares about the least advantaged and that government has a specific role. And I am being pretty persuaded by his, um, by his essay. And then I remember for theory of moral sentiments, just really liking it. Um, and it took me a while to be critical of theory of moral sentiments because I thought, isn't this just how everyone thinks about social interactions and how um, relationships are formed in society and the basis for civil society? Like this just is true. Um, and specifically the joke um, Smith tells about jokes um, when he's explaining how sympathy works to say, um, you understand when you're in a group when someone tells a joke and one person in the group laughs a lot longer than they should and everyone looks at them and that's sort of explaining how we take home um, others emotional processes to ourselves and imagine what our response would be. I just thought, yeah, that's true. Um, and so yeah, those were my first first sort of reactions. Well, thanks for sharing those with us. But we're going to fast forward to the present, to your paper um, that just came out in print. Congratulations. Okay. What is the question that the paper is answering and why did you decide to write it? Yeah, so broadly the question the paper is answering is, is it possible in a cosmopolitan liberal society to connect with distant others um, without objectifying them? Um, and then I take that question really specifically to Smith, and then for him, it becomes, can taste or aesthetic judgment bridge the gap in sympathy that happens when we're trying to sympathize with someone that we don't know, or that is far away from us, or has a different lifestyle, culture, economic um, situation, et cetera. On the macro level, I'm trying to promote the idea that Smith understands that lots more people are going to be involved in political and economic processes in modern society. And he's trying to think about ways to engage these individuals in political conversations and political economic judgment and moral judgment. And on the more narrow level, I'm trying to answer that by um, really pointing to what I think is an underexplored role of taste um, to supplement the limitations of, of sympathy. Um, I think sympathy is essential and important. Um, in the 18th century, it was turned to a lot to try to deal with issues of, of self-interest and it's really enjoying a resurgence today, but sympathy has a sort of high bar of requirement for Smith to imaginatively change places with someone, to not be overly interested in oneself, um, and taste really has a lower, a lower threshold. Um, I also, for his political economy, um, think it has important implications. I try to show how um, there's not just good taste, but there's also bad taste, and it really can um, make the problem of sympathetic distance much worse. Um, and then I also think looking at taste in his political economy helps us understand um, why sometimes the market doesn't work to extend sympathy in the ways that we, we think it should. 
Well, the paper is a chapter from my book project. Um, and so this was the one um, that I sort of wanted to pursue uh, publishing publishing first and was sort of farthest along. But the, the project as a whole looks at um, taste in the 18th century as a kind of a proxy for moral judgment, um, a way to um, develop uh, relationships between individuals and to hone citizens judgment more generally. And I got interested in this um, topic, broadly sort of watching political polarization play out, especially when I was in graduate school, um, after Donald Trump was elected, and I was really trying to think about how people can relate to one another across party lines or um, huge ideological differences. And I noticed this thread in many texts um, in the 18th century about taste acting as this way to connect um, people. Uh, and I've also just always found um, theories of, of judgment interesting, like how people are making decisions and how they relate those decisions to one another when there has to be some kind of group or collective component to decision-making. Um, and I really noticed how taste was just acting as another version of moral and political judgment um, in the 18th century and could solve certain political problems. And I, I also especially noticed, and this is why it was interesting for me and Smith, how taste uh, is so different from economic judgment in the way that economists talk about rational choice. Um, yeah, and then I guess just broadly, I've always been interested in the aesthetic, how music, literature, and art um, can, can move us. And, and for Smith, he's talking about taste right at the beginning of TMS alongside his description of sympathy. And I thought, how come nobody's talking about this? It seems important to him if he's introducing it really in the early chapters with, with sympathy. And I wanted to try to figure out what was going on there. The next question I know might be hard to answer because I know you would try to answer obvious objections in the paper itself. But what do you think is a part of the argument in your paper that others in your field are most likely to disagree with or most likely to try to respond to critically? Yeah, I hopefully got some of these out of the way responding to, uh, you know, the prominent pesky reviewer too that we all encounter when we're trying to publish academic papers. Um, but really the reviews um, that I got for Polity and for other um, outlets I had tried really improved the paper. Um, but I think people are still going to maybe disagree with the application of taste to the colonial example. So you sort of talked about um, how I, I talk about taste can have these positive implications, but also can have these negative implications. And when I talk about its positive implications for the market, I talk about the way in which um, taste can be a beginning point for um, shared uh, sympathetic judgments across distance um, to sort of help the market or build on the market working. Um, and then I have a much longer discussion about ways in which it might it might not work. And I was trying to say Smith is a nuanced thinker that he um, is never sort of all in, I think, on any, any of his recommendations. He realizes their limitations. And so when I apply it to the colonial example, I'm saying that um, bad taste um, really clouds their judgment or their ability to see beyond their power and greed. I think people's objection to that is going to say that bad taste is really an irrelevant example, maybe, or an irrelevant variable in the actions of the colonists. Um, the colonizers are really driven by greed. They're driven by power. Like, is taste telling us much about this behavior? Um, others might say that my using taste is um, ignoring the inhumanity of their behavior. Um, and I don't think Smith is doing either of those things. And I, I don't mean to say those. I think Smith is really saying that bad taste replaces greed. But I do think he means to show how misunderstanding taste can have consequences for viewing others as objects um, rather than fellow human beings. Or when we're exercising bad taste, it makes it easier for us to objectify others and forget their humanity. Um, so certainly, Smith is not saying, I'm not saying that taste is the only factor in imperialism and colonialism, but he's using a lot of language that I developed in the paper to show that aesthetic judgment um, and a misunderstanding of it is definitely at play. Great. Um, I think that uh, one, other, one other thing people might take issue with is really pointing to taste at all. Um, some people might say that taste is not political in the way that I'm suggesting it is. Um, 
or that it doesn't really matter that much for a liberal political um, order. Um, I obviously think it has a lot of a lot of relevance. I'm really trying to pay attention to not just the sort of formal institutions, but also those um, informal interactions that I think make a liberal society work. Thank you for that. So we've talked about your past and your present. Now I want to look to your future. What are you working on right now or what's the next project you're excited about? I'm still at work on the larger book manuscript of which this paper um, is a part. Um, that project is tentatively titled uh, Beyond Rights and Price, Liberalism with Taste, really trying to think about um, this sort of emerging um, situation of modern society where, as I was saying before, like many more people are going to be um, part of uh, the political and economic processes beyond elites and how are they uh, relating to one another um, and can taste really help think about some of the problems that um, are emerging with liberal society having to do with self-interest and individualism. Um, so I'm working on that still. And then I've got um, a piece on Smith trade um, judgment and patriotism that I'm, I'm working on, um, one on uh, Tocqueville and bankruptcy, and then one on um, the division of uh, virtues, like the division of labor. I think that there is that. Um, I'm co-authoring with someone um, about Smith's political economy. Those all sound really exciting, especially the last one. Um, but... I'm really excited about it. Um, yeah, we're we're at the beginning stages of of thinking about it, but I think we've stumbled upon a lacuna um, in the way people talk about Smith's thought. That's wonderful. Okay, so there's no uh, ice bucket challenge here at Adam Smith <laughs> Works, but I would like to know who you think is a a person I should talk to or a, a paper that I should talk to someone um, about for our for our next episode. If you have an idea for someone who would be be a good person to talk about their work. Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, I'm going to deny the premise of the question and, and mention too. <laughs> um, so uh, Alexandra O'Prea just wrote an excellent piece for the Journal of Politics on Adam Smith and political judgment. And she focuses on clamor and um, the protests of the people in response to economic decisions and government in Smith's Wealth of Nations, um, rather than just looking at sort of the political elite or the statesman's judgment in politics. Um, so that one is, is great. And then I'm also interested in a wonderful um, new piece that's actually related um, by Michelle Schwarzy and Edward Frame that just came out online first, I think, in Political Research Quarterly on how to um, education can be a means to political judgment. Um, so either of those would be great subjects for future interviews. Wonderful. Well, I will do my best to, to, to try to try to convince them to, to join us. So thank you, Brianne, for going on this uh, adventure in academic papers with me today. Yeah, I welcome any um, feedback or thoughts on the on the paper or the ideas in the paper for anybody watching. And thanks so much to Christy and to Adam Smith Works and Liberty Fund for having me. This was great. Thank you.